Biology often gets a bit of a bad rep, especially from people interested in physics. I think the reason why is sort of summed up in the quote from Ernest Rutherford that all science is either physics or stamp collecting. Often when we first learn about biology, it's more to do with memorizing lots of discrete things, whether it's words or functions. And it seems a little bit unsatisfying in the sense that there doesn't seem to be many unifying principles involved. However, if you look a bit closer at biology, there are some unifying ideas, one of which is life itself and the fact that life evolves or that genetic information changes over time. In this video, I'm going to take a bit of a dive into the field of computational biology, showing you the intersection of biology with math, physics and computer science. I think that there is overlap between these fields, uh, probably a lot more than you think, and this is a continuation of my study with me series, so I'm not necessarily an expert on this topic, but hopefully we can learn together here. I'm working through the computational biology course on brilliant.org, and a link to this course will be down in the description so you can follow along if you want to. This page is talking about um, Charles Darwin and how he was trying to find similarities or relatedness between different bird species. And he was doing this with the finches by looking at, I guess, the shapes of their beaks and trying to find a unification there. Some of Darwin's theories were not necessarily convincing because looking for shared features like this is not something that you can do with all organisms. Uh, however, if you get closer, uh, and I'm talking to the small scale of like DNA and molecules, um, we do see a similarity uh, between all life forms, and that's that um, all life from bacteria to dinosaurs have a DNA genome and uses this genetic information to program the cells to do things like make proteins, RNA, everything else that makes up the organism. This is a way to connect the family trees of organisms that might not otherwise seem to be related at all. We can connect them to having a common ancestor which also had DNA. Looking down to genetic information actually gives us a lot to work with in biology. It is something that is discrete and you can quantify it. We have a page here about the Human Genome Project. So this is something that has given us, you know, um, a lot of information to work with. We have the complete genomes of hundreds of animals and plants, each consisting of gigabytes of data. So we have all of this information now. It says here that this rise in genetic sequencing has been a gold rush for information theorists, renewing the techniques that were used in communication, signal processing, and statistical physics for this new frontier of biological information. So now that we have all this data, what problems should biology research be focusing on to make the most of it? And I guess we're going to have a look at some of those ideas throughout the rest of this video. Genetic sequencing really does provide the motivation for mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, whoever, to really become interested in biological problems, which I guess beforehand did give it that reputation of stamp collecting, which I don't think applies anymore. One idea that we can start to shed some light on is the connection between genetic information and biological structures. So all humans are like 99.9% .9 genetically similar, but we see huge differences between us, um, or they might look huge, but they're down to you know, very small differences in our genetic makeup. These differences come mostly from random genetic mutations throughout human history. One thing to note though is that genetic code is surprisingly error tolerant. Uh, two mutations, especially two single nucleotide mutations, which are the mutations described here on this page, where we have uh, one base incorrectly becoming another base. So just as a quick refresher, we have um, DNA, which is made up of, in this case, four bases, A, T, G, and C, and they pair with each other to form this double helix uh, set of instructions for our cells. Um, so 
what goes on a lot in our cells is that we have to copy, uh, make new copies of, of DNA. And during that process, there's always room for some mutations or for things to go slightly wrong. Uh, so you can see in this example here, we have two sequences of DNA. Uh, and there are eight mutations, which are in the red. So these don't match up uh, and there are seven matches. So at least eight mutation events have happened, getting from sequence one to sequence two. It goes on to say that mistakes at the DNA level don't always translate to mistakes in protein blueprints. So this DNA here is coding for a protein to be made in a cell. In fact, the instructions that cells follow to change a DNA sequence into a protein is often very robust uh, to these mutations. So we can even use the translation function in Python below to find the protein encoded by these two strings of DNA. Throughout this computational biology course, you can learn how to build your own functions in Python, which is a coding language uh, and very useful for science. Um, but we're going to just look at how useful having something like this, a coding language, can be to understanding some of these biological ideas. So for now, we're just going to click run code. Um, but if you're interested, you can come on to Brilliant and have a look at this code. Uh, and you can even learn sort of the fundamentals of Python yourself through some of their other courses to actually understand what's going on here. This code is going to replicate the biological process of translation, which reads DNA three letters at a time. Each three letters corresponds to an amino acid and uh, we string all these amino acids together to make up our protein. So let's see how you do that in code. Uh, we're defining our two DNA sequences to be translated. We then define a function, translate, which takes that DNA um, that we've defined and outputs our translated protein sequence at the end, it returns it. We then are making a dictionary, uh, which is storing each um, combination of three uh, bits of DNA, three bases, and what component of the protein they would make, so I guess what amino acid. Um, we are then going to iterate through our DNA sequence three letters at a time until the end. And for each triplet of DNA, we're going to append that corresponding protein letter from our dictionary to our growing protein sequence. Then at the end, we're just going to return the translated protein sequence. And what we get out is that both of our sequences that we saw before translate into exactly the same protein. The protein is called salty here. Uh, and each letter of salty is made up of a triplet of DNA. So that's pretty cool, but what is really surprising is that through these sequences, even though there were eight single mutations and differences between them, at the end of translation, they actually make exactly the same protein. So that's what I mean about it being sort of error tolerant. We can take another look at the power of some of these computational tools in our next example here. Uh, and this one is all about cats, my favorite animal, and it's about something called polydactyly, uh, which is when uh, an individual has an excessive number of fingers or toes. Cats typically have 18 toes, um, but a cat with this condition has four extra toes, a total of 22. So this condition is caused by mutations, and this time the mutations are propagating through to actually change the individual, what it looks like. We can use a combination of coding on Python and some statistical methods to actually find out, you know, where the offending mutation occurs in the DNA of the cats. So the way we're going to do this uh, is to compare the genetic sequence of five control cats and five affected cats. Yep, so we track down the exact position where the mutation can result in extra toes. So let's just have a look uh, through some of the notes of what's going on in this bit of Python here. Again, don't worry about understanding it all step by step now. You can take a look at this yourself. Um, this is just to illustrate the power of some of these tools. 
So first of all, we're going to define two sets of DNA. We've got some DNA from control cats and some from the affected cats. We're then defining a function frequency lists, which is collecting statistical information about um, the DNA nucleotides or the bases in each position of the sequence. So we're trying to figure out do some parts of the sequence tend to be different for the polydactyl cats. We go through there and for each nucleotide at each, each position we run a statistical test. In this case uh, we're actually running the chi-squared test which you might have heard of if you've done a bit of statistics. And we're using that to determine whether there is a significant difference in frequency between the control and the case cats. Yep, as well as using chi-squared, we're also looking at the p-values. We want your p-value to be low, kind of indicates that what you've seen is not just due to random chance. Then at the end, we're just printing the positions and the nucleotides, which showed the most statistical difference between the case cats and the control cats. Um, and we're printing the p-value. So this is our output here. We have four different potentially offending um, nucleotide bases or changes in the base. We have the position in the DNA sequence where it occurs and the p-value or how likely it is to be basically causing this condition in the cats. So our lowest p-value here uh, is for the first and third option, which means that at position 81, there definitely seems to be something going on and it looks like we've had a change from an A to a G nucleotide. So that's just an example of how we can start to sort through all this information that we have and start to get some useful results out of it that actually give us insight into what's really going on. How does genetic information lead to changes in what we're seeing in individuals? The Brilliant course goes more in depth into connecting genetic information with biological structure whilst introducing the Python language for beginner programmers. So if you would like to work through the rest of this at your own pace, you can go to brilliant.org slash tibbies and sign up for free. Also, the first 200 people to do so can get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching.